Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Daily Friends Show. I'm your host, Nicholas Lorimer. Today, I'm joined by Mr. Chris Hutton. Chris, how are you doing? Hey, Nick and Charlene, you are doing okay, thanks. A sad day for the RR and for for, for the liberal movement in South Africa, but uh, we're here to honor John's memory and to continue the work. Indeed, and we will get to that uh, a little bit shortly after after we finish our ad read. And uh, Sholem, um, also good to have you here with us today. How are you doing? Yeah, Nick, I'm, um, I'm doing good and all, as always excited to be on the show, man. Cool. So just first a word from our sponsor, Bitvice. Um, they say that uh, Bitcoin is the complete hedge against glo the global debasement of money, inflation and government overreach. Bitvice is a South African first Bitcoin only self custody solution that helps individuals and entities buy and hold Bitcoin for the long term. Bitvice believes that everyone should hold their own Bitcoin and trust no one else. Recently, there have been a plethora of crypto custodians going bankrupt, taking their clients Bitcoin with them. That is why Bitvice never holds your Bitcoin. They send it immediately to your own Bitcoin wallet where you hold the keys. They don't hold your keys. They don't hold your coins. Simply sign up to Bitvice, link your bank account securely and buy Bitcoin in seconds. Visit bitvice.io and begin your journey in buying and securing the scarcest asset that mankind has ever created. And once again, we thank them very much for sponsoring us. So for us at uh, the IRR, the Daily Friend, the CRA, the Freedom Advocacy Network, the sort of whole, this uh, liberal network in South Africa, uh, we lost one of our greats um, last night, unfortunately. And that is, of course, Mr. John Cain Berman who was a former CEO of the Institute of Race Relations from 1983 until 2014. Um, I'm going to just quickly go through a little bit of uh, his life, but I won't be able to do it justice at all, which is why tomorrow there will be a special podcast uh, with uh, current CEO John Endress and former CEO Franz Cronier on his life and achievements. Um, so yeah, look out for that. But uh, John Kane Berman, um, some of you may know him from his writings in Politics Web and The Daily Friend. Uh, but he had a very, very long, illustrious career. Uh, he, he studied at uh, St. John's College in Houghton, and then he went to Witz, and then finally to uh, Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar. Um, he came from a pretty political family. His father, Louis, uh, was a household name in South Africa. So he was a chairman of the Torch Commando, which were Second World War veterans who rallied to the cause when nationalists sought to take colored voters off the voters' roll. Um, uh, when uh, at Witz, uh, John Kent Berman led campaigns against social segregation and government interference in higher education, earning him the wrath of many apartheid government ministers. He himself was accused of being, quote, a totalitarian liberal while he was a member of NUSAS um, and was accused of also being a front for foreign ideologies, with the risk of being manipulated by pro-communist elements. Uh, at one point, he also even had a run-in, I believe, with John Foster, who was not pleased to see him at all. Uh, he then later got a job after coming, went, going to Oxford and coming back at the Financial Mail, um, where he used it as an opportunity to write about many issues. Um, many of them were very embarrassing to the apartheid government. Uh, he wrote a book on the Soweto uprisings called Soweto Black Revolt White Reaction, which was very famous and um, had a lot of lessons for South Africa that it should have taken to heart in 1976, but uh, he was unfortunately only truly proven right 30 years later. He was then appointed a CEO of the Institute of Race Relations in 1983, uh, and it was very close to being bankrupt. He needed to rebuild its finances. He did this with incredible success. At his retirement, it boasted a war chest of over 40 million rand, um, which has <laughs> very contributed to keeping all of us employed. So I'm thankful to the work of Mr. John Kent Berman, even from just that level. Um, he also did a lot of work, and this earned him a lot of enemies from people who used to admire him, in keeping the Institute out of the umbrella of the United Democratic Front, um, the, the ANC sort of umbrella organization. He very uh, he fought very hard, fought very hard both, both, at, both at, at, um, at uh... New SAS and at, uh, and at the IRR to prevent the IRR either being captured by the right or left. And during the 80s, there was a very big push to align the IRR with the ANC rather than sticking true to its liberal principles. He refused to back down, um, and ultimately he won that battle. 
uh, when there was a huge amount of pressure on him to keep the IRR independent from the ANC and keep pushing for the values that it endorses still to this very day of non-racialism. He gave over 700 public speeches and wrote many reports during his time as the CEO of the IRR, of the, the CEO of the IRR, um, many newspaper columns, uh, a number of books, um, one of the most influential being The Silent Revolution, which was published in 1989, talking about the ways that apartheid was sort of collapsing from individual actions, ordinary people. Um, uh, our, our current CEO, John Endress, says his brave and unstinting commitment to the liberal cause inspired legions of South African liberals, myself included. John Kane Berman was known for his eloquent presentation, exceptional memory, thorough command of his subject matter, and exemplary discipline. He was demanding, setting the highest standards for himself and others because he realized the importance of the project he was engaged in to insist that nothing less than true non-racialism and personal freedom would, al would allow the dignity and prosperity of all South Africans to flourish. Uh, John Kane Berman's own words about himself were, I myself never had any weapons other than words. He is survived by his longtime life partner, Pierre, and we send condolences to Pierre and his whole family. Uh, it's a very great loss for us. Uh, I, I, he was a great guy um, in many ways, great intellect, and the liberal movement in South Africa, I think, is much poorer for it. Um, Sholin, anything to add very briefly before we move on to the show? Um, what I would say, Nick, is that I am genuinely grateful for, obviously, this, that the work that um, John Ken Berman did, um, not just for the IRR, but for the entire liberal movement um, in South Africa. Um, I think we just discussed, Nick, um, if JKB did not put in the work and time and effort that he did, um, where would the liberal tradition have been in South Africa? Um, I, in some alternate reality, it's a, probably a very unfortunate um, scene for liberalism. But due to obviously his effort and so forth, it's, and the legacy that he basically put down, it's definitely very beneficial for this country. And I think um, today is should definitely serve as a reminder, as I'm sure you'd want it to be, serve as a reminder that um, our work for freedom and liberty, uh, it's merely only just begun, and that we should take this um, in, in our stride and, yeah, continue what he has laid down, for sure. Chris? Uh, just, just to say that if if those of us involved at, at the RR and and other organisations attain even ten to twenty percent of the work and the commitment and the principle defending that JKB did, then I think liberalism is in a very strong suit going forward, and that's probably the best um, the best way we can pay honour to him is to continue continue that fight for the right reasons. No, very definitely. Um, and I would encourage everyone to check out the, uh, the the full obituary we've put on the dailyfriend.co.za, um, just remembering his life and contribution to South Africa and to the IRR. All right, so let's move on to our first story, and this is about uh, the delicate coalitions that are going on across the country. So, of course, um, the country already has a number of very shaky coalition governments, uh, one of them being in uh, Johannesburg, another in Tswane, another in Ekuruleni. Um, there have been several attempts to create other ones, such as in uh, uh, Eteguini, which failed on, uh, to, to, to unseat the ANC there. And another attempt was made in Nelson Mandela Bay shortly after the election to create a coalition, which failed there and saw the ANC return to power in the city after it was under a shaky uh, a DA coalition for a while. However, today, uh, the DA announced that it was signing a coalition agreement with several other parties to take back control of Nelson Mandela Bay from uh, uh, from the ANC, um, and the, the city has been the, the municipality has been uh, distressed by many crises recently, including a major water shortage. So it's not a fun position to be in to be governing that mess. Um, but what's quite interesting is the composition of this coalition government, which is, shall we say, diverse, <laughs> to put it politely. Uh, the coalition consists of the Democratic Alliance, the Freedom Front Plus, the ACDP, African Christian Democratic Party, the AIC, also known as the African Independent Congress, the Ubuntu Integrity Movement, the PAC, the Pan-Africanist Congress, and the United Democratic Movement, the UDM, who famously fell out with the DA uh, after 2016 
um, due to the coalition negotiations there. I think they had the deputy mayorship and the DA wanted to fire the UDM mayor because they said he was corrupt and that caused the UDM to withdraw support. So uh, I guess the question really is, is this coalition going to last, firstly? And secondly, you know, these parties, you can see maybe the Freedom Front Plus, the ACDP, um, the DA, and maybe to some degree the UDM kind of getting along on, on, on at least a number of issues. But at the same time, there's also quite a lot of differences between those parties. Um, let me start with you, Chris. What do you make of the prospects for this coalition government? Do you think it will be able to change the situation in Nelson Mandela Bay? I suppose the maybe the easiest way to answer a very difficult question, as you say, a very diverse coalition is how much are they going to agree on the immediate priorities and reforms that they need to implement in Nelson Mandela Bay to effect tangible, tan, tangible change for the voters. If you don't get that stuff right and the voters see more bickering, then the likelihood is that that will increase pressure on the coalition partners and that in turn means more infighting, that means a shorter lifespan, that means the coalition won't last that long. So can they agree on some of those things? Can they get those changes in effect? In effect? Can they change around what previous administrations have been doing or not? So just, um, to, I, I do just to flesh that again. out, um, the DA says that they uh, spent four months in negotiation with the various partners here and that all parties have agreed to sign on to a document and a formal agreement with um, shared values, commitments and objectives. So um, this is how coalition governments are done, for example, in Germany. Uh, mm -hmm. where all the parties sign very detailed, extensive coalition agreements before they form a government together. Do you think that that's going to work here? Well, it's all well and good having things on paper, but when you get into the, the, the dirtiness of governance and politics and you need to roll back some of what came before, are you actually going to stick to those agreements and stick to those principles? Are you going to compromise or not? How are you going to sell it to your voters? Are you going to convince people that you are trying to affect change? I mean, even now... In city of Joburg, we've had a coalition government for a while, but a lot of voters, people on the ground and civil society groups aren't saying that they're seeing the necessary changes. So that increases, again, the pressure on the coalition. And will they again get the necessary votes in upcoming municipal elections sort of thing? Um, I do think South Africans should get used to this sort of setup. Um, talking about places like Israel and Germany, if you think that those politics are messy, get used to that sort of thing in South Africa. This also forms part of the analysis that we would do at the CRA, for example, for clients, when we talk about getting yourself used to coalition politics and that this is probably how South African politics is going to look going forward. Um, it won't just be dominated by one or two players anymore, but it's about uh, getting the, the power sharing right and, and getting the, the few principles and practical policy changes in place that you want to agree on. And then moving from there, I'm, I want to be hopeful for the people now, some Manila Bay, I mean, been subject to all sorts of maladministration and, and abuses and that sort of thing for the last while. Someone who studied in the Eastern Cape, I want to see municipalities there doing better, but don't hedge your bets on everything being solved right now by this coalition. It's going to take a while to get some of these teething problems right. Sholin, what do you make of this? You said that you uh, had a strong feeling of optimism about the potential for this coalition. Yeah, Nick, I have to say I am rather um, optimistic um about this um i know in south africa politicians usually don't give us a reason to be um hopeful or actually have um you know mm, yeah have, have you have, have good uh, views of the future um but i think we are always bashing um political parties and politicians you know for usually being self for, for being selfies and so forth but in this instance i do think that we should be we should actually be hopeful that this translates into um better circumstances for the people um in the region um, and this will probably be a template um, going forward, as we've seen in Gauteng as well. This will be a template for how things are going to be run in the country um, after 2024. And if you are a person who wants a democratic South Africa, where power is not centralized in, you know, in a specific individual or in a political party, um, this is the sort of development that should actually stir some... Um, patriotism maybe inside of your bones um, because I also think that you know what even the differences that might tear these things these um, parties apart it's not only based on ideological differences I think but there's also the thing regarding um, positions um, in the municipality um, 
and and the management of resources, who gets control of what, that is probably a more bigger issue that I think will be divisive amongst um, the political parties than necessarily um, ideological differences. And I also um, Nick just read um, that they were actually mentioning that a concern is that what about um, the EFF um, in this region? Because supposedly the um, political parties, even with the current coalition, um, will need some um, external um, support from other political parties for, I think it's for the, for the budget votes um, when it comes to those things. Um, and that is also a concern of how that will actually play out. But I think we should rather be hopeful and, yeah, hope for the best. <laughs> no, I agree with you definitely that uh, fighting over patronage and resources is often actually, especially at the local level, far more of a concern. Um, uh, also, uh, there probably is, you know, ideological differences do definitely make uh, uh, difficulties because, you know, you have to decide on, for example, are, is BEE going to be a priority of a municipality, um, the ANC and... I'm sure at least some of the parties in this coalition would say yes, and some of the parties in this coalition would say no, absolutely not. Um, so that will be something that that will need to kind of be worked out. But there is more scope for cooperation at a local level when a lot of the issues are just about you know management, um, making sure that municipal entities work correctly, that kind of thing. And so yeah, it remains to be seen whether they can make it work. Uh, whether the patronage battles tear apart this coalition. And like you say, yeah, a, a shaky ground because even with this coalition, this diverse coalition, yeah. there still may be opportunities to fall it over, to collapse it from the outside anyway. But um, good luck to them. Uh, Chris, do you have anything to add? Cool, cool, cool. All right, then let us move on to our next story. And this is um, some sad news that uh, a game ranger, Anton Zimba, who was the head of uh, the sort of game ranger um, services at Timbavati Private Game Reserve, uh, who had a pretty good reputation in the area and had received many international visitors, um, has been apparently shot and killed, presumably by poachers, although not all of the details are entirely clear yet. And he was described um, in the reporting on him as a wildlife warrior and even received condolences for his passing from Prince William. He was apparently shot on Tuesday um, from the UK. And uh, this guy had a, had a long career. Um, he, had, he had joined the sort of uh, uh, conservation services in 1997 as an erosion field worker and went on to become a game ranger and then a senior game ranger later. Um, Prince William said, I'm deeply saddened to learn of the killing of Anton and Zimba, who I spoke to in November. Committed and brave, rangers like Anton are central to the conservation of Africa's fantastic wildlife. Those responsible must be swiftly brought to justice. My thoughts are with his family. Um, Tim Bavati, Nature Reserve themselves said, Anton lived his beliefs, never wavered from his convictions, and above all, remained a brave and honest man. And there's, a, of course, a deeper underlying, I think, sort of policy question here, and that is one that we don't talk about a lot on this show, but I think it's maybe worth visiting, and that is uh, conservation, poaching. Uh, I think, you know, South Africa, uh, everyone kind of recognizes that particularly for South Africa's rural areas, our wildlife tourism industry is uh, has a lot of potential and already does quite a lot of business. Um, uh, a lot of foreign sort of game hunters come here as well as... Uh, um, tourists to see our wildlife um our, our, one of our colleagues said that overseas the main things that people seem to think about south africa these days is crime and magnificent animals so you know we've already got that great uh, sort of reputational bedrock there from which to build but um the question the question is you know how do we draw, pull back something like poaching poaching has been a very serious i think threat to these industries um, especially rhinos, which are had to have an enormous amount of security in order to protect them from being attacked for their horns. Uh, Chris, what are some of the policy solutions you think that we can we can get at to maybe try and reduce um, the level of poaching in our conservation areas? Yeah, I'll definitely gonna, I'm going to be a second hander and pull from the writing and analysis of Ivo Fechter, someone who I held quite highly in, in writing on these issues. So I would recommend reading some of his pieces uh, at the Daily Friend website um, on ecological and environmental topics, including poaching. But 
a possible lesson to apply is simple supply and demand. So if you try and artificially constrict um, supply, then you're going to increase demand and then you're going to increase the stakes for that demand. So if you're going to ensure that, for example, through your government regulations, um, the, the stock of rhino in a given area declines, uh, then you're going to increase the price thereof. If you're going to raise those stakes, then you're going to make sure that either local or international poachers are going to go to higher lengths to get that dwindling stock, for example. So I'd recommend at least a basic application of policing um, those sorts of resources, the rule of law, that kind of thing, making sure that prosecution is done effectively. So it's not just about throwing money at it, but getting the right people and processes in place. And you can lower some of those costs. So we can't put it all in the government, of course, but you can use technology to your advantage. You can use drones, all that sort of stuff. Maybe have fewer men in the field, men and women, but then make sure that they can cover wider areas if they use the right technology um, and then also just secondly you aren't going to necessarily get rid of all of it and that doesn't mean that you can't use the money that you get from from at least uh, investing it properly you can't use that to to increase um, the sort of the population of a given species you can use it accordingly to make sure that species will continue to exist um, regardless and then finally getting the right training in place for rangers and people working in game parks and that sort of thing making sure that also, they are integrated with the communities around them. I mean, they know best how those environments look, how animals maybe migrate and function. Don't just assume, you know, you can come in and, and drop and play, uh, plug and play different things that have worked in other parks or other locales. Work with the people around there to make sure that those animal populations are protected. Just so, yeah, some, some rough ideas. Shalin, um you know the, the the syndicates that pull off this this poaching stuff are often quite sophisticated, and they're you know a lot of them are involved in selling you know sort of animal parts to countries in Asia, um, uh, Vietnam and China in particular, I think. And so you know they're not just like a couple of local guys getting together and deciding to shoot a rhino, but I, I'm sure that they do rely at least a little bit on maybe local informants or guides or collaborators to sort of carry out some of these activities. Uh, do you think that maybe, you know, improving the economic conditions in our rural areas would perhaps uh, have a positive impact on poaching? Yeah, no, um, I definitely think so, because it would mean that um, people are then less likely to obviously engage in criminal activity like this. Um, I, and I think um, tourism is exactly one of um, our best selling points um, as a country. And that's why we should be utilizing it to the best of our ability. But um, maybe um, it has not necessarily gone down well, um, especially with regards to like safety and security, um, whether it's things like um, farm murders in um, rural areas or this instance taking place. Um, we know that those are areas where safety and security is maybe not the priority of um, our government um, right now. And especially when we cannot afford that our tourism sector should be, um, you know, this, this incident should be attached to our tourism um, sector. Because, I mean, when foreigners come and they come from, you know, wealthier um, European countries per se, where um, they know that the safety security is, they, is good, they will not be coming to South Africa where they will be either, you know, stuck in darkness or the security will be um, placed at risk. Um, that is not a, a good um, tourism selling point that you know would um, increase our economic situation. Therefore, I definitely believe um, that would go a long way, Nick, for sure, in, for improving the economic situation in our rural areas. Yeah, no, definitely an issue that uh, needs more attention. And I suspect if uh, economic and law and order conditions were generally better across the country and say, for example, our borders were better policed. Because, um, of course, some of our big parks in the country uh, where we have animals like the Kruger are trans frontier parks. So they are right on the border and spill out into over into places like Botswana, Zim, um, yeah. Mozambique. And so policing those borders would probably also help to maybe control some of the trade. But anyway, a uh, yeah, uh, a complex issue that's going to take, I think, quite a while to fix um, and, a, and a sad loss for the conservation industry. But let's go on to our last story of today. And this is one that um, I think amused all of us greatly, uh, which kind of shows the changing conditions in the country um, politically and how fast they have been. It was not long ago that people were paying 
top rand in order to get a seat at the table with President Cyril Ramaphosa. There were um, many business people falling over themselves to be photographed with uh, uh, our president. Um, he was, of course, the darling of many of the media. And um, he has since, shall we say, run into some publicity difficulties, namely related to the Palapala conference, but also due to the lack of reform. That's uh, that uh, his promised reform that has emerged since he took over leadership of the ANC and the country. At a recent ANC gala dinner, um, according to some reporting by News24, there was a very low turnout of fundraisers, including at the president's table, where uh, you are, for the price of between 15,000 to a million rand, able to sit with the president. Um, the, the funds would go to the ANC, so this is an ANC fundraising activity, and there were lots of empty chairs. In fact, according to ANC Treasurer Paul Mashatile, the party had struggled to get people to attend and almost cancelled this particular fundraising dinner. Um, this was hosted by the ANC Progressive Business Forum. So in the end, they managed to pull through, but I think this really does show the difficult situation that the ANC is in uh, and how the winds have changed, that they can't even get funders to show up to some of their events. Of course, it's not helped by the fact that the ANC is not well known for being a custodian of its own money. Um, I believe that there are uh, stories, I'm not sure if they're confirmed yet, that ANC staff have once again not been paid uh, at the organization. So there's clearly some big problems going on there. Sholin, what do you make of this? Yeah, no, I definitely think it's hilarious, Nick. Um, I, it's not surprising either that the ANC literally has to go and big um, private individuals or wealthy individuals to come and sit at the table with our president. Um, that should tell you a lot about the state of your um, president to your political party if you need to be begging people to be sitting with your senior leadership. Um, because clearly everybody is no longer convinced um, that Mr. Um, Ramadol is um, has the capabilities that he'd like um, us to believe that he has. Um, we know that, you know, Ramaphosa is definitely, he prides himself on being a man of process and planning. Um, but to us, I think it appears more that he has no action. Um, he's incapable of taking any action. And while that's his unique selling point, it's clearly not working. And we know that the ANC is in a desperate Fortunately, I should say, the ANC is in a desperate situation where they aren't even able, um, you know, to manage their own finances. Um, and we've even seen that they can't even pay their own employees, um, whether it's at the Thule House or in other structures within the organization. Um, that is clear signs of an ANC falling apart. And for South Africa, um, that is a, a, a positive um, um, prospect that should take place, in my view, at least. Chris, what do you make of this? Uh, we have the ANC policy conference coming up this weekend, actually started today, and I'm sure that we'll see a drastic revision and amendment to their policies, which have led them down this route. Um, I'm sure that we will see new announcements next week so that they're going to question why donors aren't paying for these, for these seats anymore. But of course, I'm only joking. Um, yeah, we should just keep in mind that the ANC might just become more desperate now. So as possibly the taps get turned off, they might try and resort to more radical measures to retain power. There's still the possibility of some sort of state of disaster or emergency at some point. We have the disastrous electoral amendment bill um, still very much in the pipeline um, with the possibility of postponing elections indefinitely. So we all in civil society have to keep a serious eye on that. Um, but yeah, very much what the ANC deserves. Um, they have their policies and their ideology have brought then the negative consequences for south african citizens so now at least um, they're suffering some of those consequences themselves in terms of not getting funding and long may that continue indeed so all right i believe that we are very close to being out of time so thank you very much gentlemen for your thoughts uh like i said we will have a special podcast probably coming out tomorrow on the life of Mr. John Cade Berman. Um, so have a look out for that because he was uh, a fascinating guy and a great fighter for freedom and liberty in South Africa. Uh, so yeah, check check that out. Uh, also, please support the Institute of Race Relations. Um, you can do that by either going to our website, ir.org.za, clicking the Join Us button and signing up there, or you can uh, uh, SMS your name to 32823. It's on the banner behind me if you're watching on YouTube. And we will call you back to sign you up as a friend of the Institute.
Anyway, thank you very much, guys. We hope that you all have a wonderful weekend. We'll see you next week. And yeah, I hope that uh, everything goes well and you have a wonderful weekend. Cheers.